Hello, it's David from David Savory Electrical Services Limited, and today I will be looking at an item of equipment I've referred to in a couple of previous videos which has stirred up some interest. That uh, piece of equipment being the Garrow Shower Priority Control Unit. The Garrow what? You might well ask, but perhaps any viewers on the other side of the Irish Sea will be more familiar with this particular product because on the two occasions I've installed these, I've had to ship them in from Meteor Electrical based in Northern Ireland. So what does it do for the folks over there and why do I have one in my humble abode here in deepest blighty? Well, it's all about maximum demand, something I was wittering away about in a video last week where I showed a consume unit that had been installed with three 40 amp showers hanging off an RCD rated at just 63 amps. My understanding, and any commenters in Ireland or Northern Ireland do correct me if I'm wrong, is that many homes out west have a 63 amp service, which is all well and dandy until you want to start installing electric showers rated at about 40 to 50 amps each. You know, I'm actually going over to Ireland later this year, so I should be taking a peek at the service heads in Enniscrown when not blowing an unhealthy amount of euros on Guinness. Publicans of County Sligo and County Mayo, this is a heads up for you to stock up and man your pumps. Anyway, an electric shower is fine if you only have one bathroom, but these days ensuite additions or the need to install ground floor bathrooms for those with limited mobility often means a second electric shower is added to the property. While it is possible to run a shower off the heating system, in many cases these retrofit showers are electric only as the plumbing is simpler and the existing heating system may not be able to cope without itself being upgraded. In many cases, an electrical installer who lacks diligence will simply add on another electric shower without considering demand, and uh, that was the case in my EICR video from last week. Now, it's all very well telling the client that their electrical installation is too puny to cope with two instantaneous hot water appliances being on at the same time and that they should ensure that situation is avoided. But as an installer, we can't rely on that advice being heeded. And if we were to install something that is likely to fry the supplier's fuse under normal operation, then we'd likely be liable for it. A DNO being called out to replace the fuse in the service head may well decide that it should be us picking up the tab for the costs incurred if our name is on the installation certificate. Telling the client that the job isn't possible is also undesirable. Two showers is what they want, and they're waving a fistful of fifties in our faces for it to be sorted. And if we don't do it, they'll find someone, some chancer who will. So how can we keep the demand down while making the client's dream come true? Well, this is where the shower priority unit comes in. The function of this thing is to ensure only one shower can be operated at any one time, thus removing the demand issue. This kind of solution is also known as load shedding, although that term is generally more often used for larger scale management of a power system applied across whole cities or territories where demand could otherwise outstrip supply. Looking at how it's installed in my case, I have a 40 amp MCB on the high integrity side of DB1 here. Uh, this, is, uh, this 40 amp feed is what supplies my uh, shower priority unit. The feed goes directly into this uh, 40 amp type A RCBO in fact. The output from the RCBO goes to three places, a 6 amp MCB, a current sensing relay and a contactor. The relay controls the priority load and the contactor controls the non-priority load. The 6 amp MCB protects a control wire for the relay and the contactor. Switching off this MCB still leaves the relay closed and the priority load connected, but it prevents the relay and contactor from operating, so the non-priority load is left inoperative. The priority load would likely be the shower in the main bathroom, the one you generally want working all the time as it sees the most traffic. Under normal circumstances both showers have power, but when the priority load connected to the current sensing relay starts pulling over 3 kilowatts, the relay switches the contactor open, which completely removes, removes power from the non-priority load. Obviously, if the non-priority load is another electric shower, then anyone who happens to be uh, under that shower fiddling with their loofah will find their ablutions suddenly cut short. So this would have to be in a property such as a private residence where arguments can freely occur. It'd be no good in, say, a bed and breakfast where the guest, guest in one room can suddenly and without warning deprive the guest in a second room of their washing facilities. The point is though, even in a domestic premises, you end up cutting short the poor sod who was happily knocking one out under the warm water in the ensuite. Well, at least you haven't blown the main fuse and plunged the whole property into darkness. Garrow also make a non-priority version of this product, which costs a little more but works on a first-come, first-served basis. So if the person in the ensuite is already wearing a soap on a rope and singing into their shampoo bottle, then someone wishing to use the shower in the main bathroom will have to jolly well wait for them to finish, or go wash their bollocks in the sink like Nigel and I do. Not together, I hasten to add. That would be weird. 
So with this thing, both loads are connected and powered and each will work as normal if each is pulling under three kilowatts. So it's only if one load needs to slurp more juice that the device will switch over, which is rather clever. On a hot day when the shower may be on a cool setting and uh, not heating the water so much, it may actually be possible for both units to operate simultaneously. This device doesn't just have to be for electric showers, of course. I have one of these not because I have two showers, but because I have an electric shower and an electric vehicle charging point, and my cutout fuse is only rated at 60 amps. Now, the odds of these two appliances being on at the same time are low. The shower tends to get used mornings or evenings, while the car is on charge in the early hours on Economy 7. Or if it's a bright summer's day, I may uh, plop it on charge around the middle of the day where it can be charged by my solar PV installation. However, even though the chances are slim that both appliances will be in use at the same time, as an installer, I can't assume that won't happen. Hence the steps I've taken to ensure it cannot happen because of the installation of this thing. In my case, the shower has priority. If someone here needs to wash behind their ears, then of course that takes precedent over the car. And you know, with the rise in car charging points, I think Garrow are missing a trick by uh, not marketing these in the UK as a solution for car chargers on installations like mine, where the demand otherwise makes it difficult to justify the installation of a charger. Um, some of those who have asked me for more information on this device have done so because they're in the same boat of having a charge point installation on the books, but fitting such would blow the demand of the installation and make the paperwork a bit tricky to sign off. Uh, obviously, there are ways around the problem uh, with timer, uh, switching and contact arrangements, all being methods one could employ, but this is an easy off-the-shelf automated solution, which means both appliances ordinarily have power and it's only when one requires additional demand does it switch over automatically. A quick peek inside, and I admit it's not a tidy installation, but it's not like I can charge by the hour when working on my own home. You can even make one of these yourselves using the component parts. It's just an RCBO, an MCB, the relay, and a contactor. The current sensing relay is really the clever bit in here, but they can be obtained, usually with adjustable set points. Another thing which makes the Garrow good for car charging is the fact that it has a Type A RCBO by default rather than a Type AC. Uh, my Podpoint car charger is not supposed to be on a Type AC RCD, as the presence of a pulsating DC component could actually stop a Type AC unit from working. If you want to know more about that, look out for a video coming up on the Group E5 YouTube channel. There's a link to them in this video's description. Anyway, this is why I have the unit hanging off the high integrity side of DB1 via an MCB. It leaves both the shower and the car charger with their additional protection, but it uh, doesn't trouble any of the circuits or the main RCDs, uh, uh, either through normal operation or in the event of a fault. As the Garrow boards have Type A protection by default, it's again that I question why they don't flog these devices here in the UK as a domestic charge point control solution, as well as a shower sharing device. There is one thing to say about using a Garrow unit in the UK though. The enclosure here is plastic and doesn't comply with regulation 421.1.201, which came about in 17th edition Amendment 3 and has been in force since January 2016, requiring consumer units and similar switchgear assemblies to be made of a non-combustible material such as steel. The first one of these I installed was back in 2013, long before the fuckwittery of Amendment 3 came along waving the naughty stick at all things plastic. The one I've got here today sports my sticker on the front bearing a 2017 installation date, so here I've been a very bad boy. Let's get those comments over with now, shall we? Yeah, a few quick refreshes and sure enough here they fucking come, okay? Let's address that elephant in the room right now so I don't have to keep answering the same point. Amendment 3 and the requirement for metal consumer units was a sticking plaster solution to a larger industry problem. Personally, I was happier working with electrically insulated enclosures rather than steel conductive boxes. All manufacturers had to retool their production lines, so costs are up. Amendment 3 boards tend to be larger, less flexible with their entry positions, they require more robust glanding of incoming cables, in short, they're more of a pain in the arse, especially on retrofit applications. Ah, but in the event of a fire from, say, a loose connection within, a metal enclosure will contain it, yes? Well, a badly installed consumer unit is a fire risk regardless of what materials it is made out of. Look at this example I came across a couple of years ago. This poor Hager board has got more holes than a lineup of prostitutes. Considering the workmanship here, do you think we can count on the connections within to be professionally made off and secure? If they're not, will this improved enclosure contain the fire, this example being housed under wooden stairs in a sole escape route and surrounded by combustible materials? 
will it bollocks the irony here is that the old plastic 16th edition board that used to be here was a safer and better installed item even with one mismatched mcb and three non-rcd protected circuits incidentally i have this photo of the old cu because i quoted for the work at this property and i have the pictures of the new and improved board because i was called in after they appointed someone presumably cheaper who balls it all up Anyway, rather than blindly foisting metal enclosures onto the industry, steps should have been taken to define who could legitimately install these things with a set level of qualifications, experience, insurance and on-site checks being levied by the competent person schemes. Instead, any moron can pick up a consumer unit from Screwfix or B&Q and spunk it onto the wall with no regard for fire sealing, glands, grommets, IP rating, testing, certification, building regulations, notification or anything else. Before you get too busy in the comments, I appreciate many out there like Amendment 3 and prefer the metallic enclosures. Personally, I don't. And if the aim was to improve safety, then that is demonstrably not what is happening out in the real world. Worse, in fact, as Amendment 3 is a godsend for cowboy installers who now walk into people's houses, tell them that their plastic consumer unit, beautifully installed by a proper electrician in the past, is now a fire risk, and proceed to install a badly fitted, expensive and unnecessary metal replacement. I know I'm not the only one coming across bullshit C1 and C2 codings on fly-by-night EICRs for plastic consumer units. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Amendment 3 had the opposite effect to that intended, with an increase in fire incidents through poor workmanship on unnecessary board replacements, making the whole point of the thing, well, pointless. But what do I know? I haven't got letters after my name like those who write the regs, I'm just a street asshole. So back to my plastic box here. Uh, well, it, it's not under wooden stairs. It's not in a sole escape route. I'm happy that I've installed it correctly and then it's not about to burst into flames. I have an interlinked fire alarm which covers this room uh, and I spend a large amount of my day sat next to the frigging thing. So when I produced the electrical installation certificate for this, I stated in section six, details of departures from BS7671 that as the designer, I had selected equipment that was not compliant with regulation 421.1.201. Now, regulation 120.3 says that with any intended departure, the resulting degree of safety of the installation shall not be less than that obtained by compliance with the regulations. Is this less safe because it's plastic? No, because it's properly installed. The loading is within the operational limitations of the equipment and it's on my own property under my supervision. Would I install this today for a client? No, because I don't deviate from the regulations in my designs for others, even if I think certain regs are a load of old tosh. So those commenting who don't like me installing a plastic enclosure in my own home post Amendment 3 can jolly well bugger off. As I say though, although I think um, Garrow are missing a trick by not offering an Amendment 3 version of this in the UK, uh, unless they do and I just haven't found it, uh, in which case do put me right in the comments, uh, you can make up uh, one of these for yourself or shop around for an alternative but they aren't exactly easy things to get off the shelf here and I imagine your local counterbod at the likes of CEF and Eddies will probably stare blankly at you if you ask for one of these things. Incidentally, I'm indebted to my Twitter compadre Socket to him for posting this picture of one he installed using Eaton equipment he had to enclose in one of their Amendment 3 boxes to accompany this beautifully neat consumer unit. The equipment here looks like a non-priority configuration as there are two contactors and two relays, but it shows that Garrow are not the be-all and end-all when it comes to these things. Wiring diagrams for the Garrow units are available from the Meteor website should you require more information, and there's a link to the product page in the description. But once again, that's it from me for now, so... Uh, Thanks for watching.